Good morning. <clears throat> Scripture reading today of God's Word is in Esther 3, 2 through 3. <clears throat> All the king's officers would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever <clears throat> he passed by. For so the king had commanded. But Mordecai refused to bow down and show his respect. Then the, <clears throat> then the palace officers at the king's gate asked Malachi, Why are you disobeying the king's command? And in Esther 4, 13-14, Mordecai sent his reply to Esther, Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at this time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. So be it. So I don't know if you realize or not, but you don't need a sermon of any kind. Those songs had some deep theology to them. We're going to talk about some of that today. We're going to talk about sacred scriptures, and we're going to talk about other writings and songs and stuff. There's nothing wrong with these other writings, but there are sacred scriptures that are part of our Bible. And when I was listening to those words, it made me think of the Bible. It made me think of Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. She had nothing to gain whatsoever except humiliation and disgrace, right? She just sat there at his feet, caught up in his presence. She didn't want to leave that holy moment she never wanted to leave. She wasn't there for blessings. Jesus didn't owe her anything. She didn't know if this man would bring her salvation or not. She didn't, she didn't know he would lay down her life for her. But he knew, she knew that he was the Son of God. And she worshipped him. Something that the Israelites failed to do through all throughout the Old Testament that we're seeing. And something that we fail to do so much. Even if Jesus didn't offer us eternal life, he still deserves our worship. So let's start with prayer We're there. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you are a holy, righteous God. That you have showed your indescribable love to us by sending your Son to be the very thing that He created, to live a humble life and then lay down His life for us, Father. May we hear Your words today and apply them to our lives. May You open up our hearts and minds to hear You, to obey You, not to just listen to the words, but to call them into action, to worship You, for You are worthy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I've got a lot of things I want to cover today. <laughs> Simply because where we're at, we're leaving the Old Testament and going in the New Testament. And I hope that the things, the videos that I've played, the sheets that I've printed out, the way I've done the things have helped you understand. But besides helping you understand, have helped you increase an appetite for God's Word. Because it is sweeter than honey once you taste it. And the more you taste it, the more you'll want to consume it in everything. And the more you'll get to this story of Esther and realize God's not even mentioned in it. But maybe, just maybe, God's in such control that Esther was created, put into history in just this place for such a time as this. To save God's people when they didn't even know He was around. Just maybe, right? So, have you kept up with your daily Bible reading? From here out, I think I'm going to call it DBR. So if, you, if you're in with it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Have you done your DBR? Have you done your DBR? Daily Bible reading. And I told you, like I said, the New Testament is going to take 20 hours worth of use, or worth of that. I guarantee you, you'll spend 20 hours probably doing something else, not constructive, between now and December 31st. We've covered 4,000 years of human history, three-quarters of the Bible now. 
Three quarters of the Bible. Three quarters Old Testament, one quarter is New Testament. There's a lot of weight there in the Old Testament. We've covered 4,000 years worth of history. We've had 2,000 years worth of history now. There's a lot in the Old Testament to absorb. But it is tough reading through it. It's hard to understand. And the way our Bible is laid out doesn't necessarily make chronological sense. That's why we read it that way. Um, the Jews, their Bible's in a different order too. That puts more confusion out there, doesn't it? Okay, but I hope it has been enlightening for you to read this way, and I hope it has increased your hunger. We're reaching a period in time 400 years before Christ when God kind of went silent. We didn't have prophets speaking out. So that just the right time in the darkness that there could be light, that the light of the world could be made known, that Jesus Christ could become flesh and dwell among us. But then he still didn't answer all the prophecies in the Old Testament because some of them are still to come when he reigns again. He wasn't the Messiah that we hoped for because we weren't caught up in his holy worship. We did want something in return. We wanted a king and a God that would take care of our needs. And the Bible points to God is worthy no matter what. And we are His creation called to worship Him. Next week we begin the New Testament. I'll say it again, October 1st. At least I hope you're going to begin. Let me give you a dictionary definition of what New Testament means. So you know, new, it's kind of pretty easy to figure out. Old and then there's new. Okay, Not necessarily good or bad or anything, they're just old and there's new. Testament, which literally means a covenant. Here's what you'll get when you do the dictionary. Parts of the Bible that deal with life and teaching of Jesus Christ with Christianity in the early church. Okay, The collection of the books of the Bible that were produced by the early Christian church. Comprised of the Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, the Epistles, and the Revelation of St. John. And then I like this one best, the covenant because that's what testament means, between God and humans in which the dispensation of grace is revealed through Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that the God of the Old Testament is not the same God. It just means we're living in an age of grace so that we can give grace upon grace to others as we have received grace upon grace upon grace. Because we didn't deserve it, but God is a God who deserves our worship. So what was wrong with the Old Covenant? Not necessarily anything. Don't misquote me there. <gasps> Except for us. Right? If we could have kept the law, there would have been nothing wrong with the covenant. But we couldn't keep the law because we are sinful creatures who need a Savior to save us. So God came up with a better covenant written in the blood of His Son. Think about that. That's where we're at in our reading. What does God do with someone who's unfaithful? He pours out love. He pours out mercy. He pours out grace. Because that's who God is. Doesn't He deserve our thanks, our praise, and our worship? So if you're reading Esther, you might have said in that, where is the God of Esther? Because God's not mentioned at all. Not given credit for anything. There is some clues there. There's talks about fasting and stuff, but... But God's not really mentioned. And it makes me think of what a lot of Christians say today and, and misquote some other people, and I won't go any further than that, but they say, we don't need to say anything. Just our lives show it good enough and people will understand. Well, if we don't tell them what our hope is in, then, yeah, God's still working in the backgrounds, but we are called to be a light. We are called to be the hands and feet, the voice of Jesus Christ. So I don't want you to ever say, I can just live my life good enough. You're called to be ambassadors. A bas an ambassador has to speak out. You have a message that cannot be hidden. God's only son came to earth, lived as a man, and died for you. We have that joy, and when we're given the opportunity, which Peter says, we should proclaim that boldly and be equipped with His Word so that we're ready, rightly dividing the Word of truth. That we're empowered by the Spirit, that we're given the gifts and we use the gifts wisely. 
But we're going to talk today about Esther a little bit and kind of see where God is in that. So here's some questions I have for you, and you may know them or may not know them. Did you know Esther's not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Why not? Hmm. Do you know what the Jewish holiday of Purim is? Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit. What about when you were reading what seemed to be the worldliness of Mordecai and Esther? I thought we were supposed to be set apart, holy people. When you read the story, they don't seem to be much different, do they? But you and I are called to be different than the world around us. We live in a foreign land. We are aliens. We are called to live a different life so that we can proclaim why. That when we don't participate in the things we used to do, Paul says, that people are like, what? Why don't you? And then you have the opportunity to tell them. So I asked you before, and I took the sheets away so you can't see. Because <laughs> the video, if you watched it, said something that brought new enlightenment to my eyes. Because I'd never thought of Scripture this way. How did Haman die? That's my last question for right now. Don't answer, Bob. Because <laughs> we already talked about this. How did Haman die? He built a gallow to kill Mordecai. But his real purpose wasn't to kill Mordecai, was it? It was to annihilate an entire nation. Huh, if you didn't get that from the story. Mordecai was just the reason I'm going to give for my hatred towards God's people. Okay? So he built a gallows, and instead of Mordecai being killed, what happened? Haman was hung on his own gallows. So what is a gallow? <laughs> what is football? If you lived in the UK, football would be what we call soccer. Okay? If you live in the United States, football is something totally different. We think football is the greatest. Ask anybody that watched 20 million football games this past week here but didn't read their Bible. Plug. <laughs> the rest of the world thinks that we don't know the definition of football because to the world, football means something different. To gallows, we think of a hangman's noose. That wasn't a form of capital punishment back in ancient Persia. What have we been reading in the Bible? How was, uh, what happened to Jonathan and Saul? They were killed and they were hung on the wall or wherever so that their enemies would see them and see the victory that they had obtained over them. Haman wants to kill the Jews. He wants to hang Mordecai as a trophy, but instead he gets hung on what Scripture, King James Scripture calls a gallow. If you read it in the NIV, you should have the answer right here because the NIV or the NLT says a stick. So it was a 75-foot pole to stick Mordecai up on however he was killed. There was no rope involved. But all your movies, all your Sunday school stories, everything else are going to show pictures of a hangman's noose, which wasn't even in that era. Did you learn something? So... Haman got stuck on a stick. That's how he died. Okay, so I'll go back to where we're at. If you want to understand more about the book of Esther, then you've got to study Jewish history. Now, we're not scholars. You don't have to do that to understand God's Word, but I want to help you there. You have to understand some of the customs and celebrations, like the celebration of Purim. A lot, there are a lot of writings on Esther, including Josephus' writings, there are, if you didn't know it, don't throw rocks at me. I have my Catholic Bible up here. There are more writings in the Catholic Bible about Esther than there are. It's the same book of Esther. Ha! Huh. There are stories throughout history and things for Esther. Now, how do I want to say this? If you don't consider this the Holy Bible then take your scripture for Holy Bible. But there's nothing wrong with the songs we hear and other things as long as they don't contradict. There's something wrong with the song if it contradicts. There's something wrong in here if it contradicts. We're going to explain more. But some of the things I'm going to close with reading Esther's prayer because it's a wonderful prayer. It's not in our Bible, though. 
Okay, and I'll explain why. I told you that it wasn't found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That makes it kind of, hmm. And the book of Esther that we have in the Jewish Bible is what we have in our Bible. But for many years, the story of Esther was what was found in this Bible. Don't let that be confusing, and I'll explain to you why. Do you know what the canon is? It's what we consider Scripture to be by the church, because they got together and brought the books of the Bible together. It just didn't just, huh? What was that, 1300s? Well, it depends, all throughout history. First comp compilation was in the 300s. Then we have Martin Luther in the 1500s. Give you some key points, okay? In the Hebrew Bible, I mentioned that God is never mentioned. But in contrast, in the Septuagint, which means 70, because 72, they rounded to 70, Jewish scribes, six from each of the 12 nations, came together to comprise the, Old the, he the Hebrew Old Testament. It was put into Greek because Greek was the common language at that time. The Greek version of the Bible is what became into this Bible. In the Reformation, Martin Luther took out these other works, including the extra scriptures in Esther, because they weren't found in the Jewish Tanakh. I'm losing you yet? Probably. Okay? And said that they were not holy scriptures. He never said anything was wrong with them, but he put them at the back. A few years later, the... Um, and let me see if I can find how they explain it in here. Um, a few years later, the council got together and said in the Catholic that, no, they should be there. Make sense? Okay. I can't remember. I can do it because it's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. No, Esther is before Psalms, right? Okay. So we should be right about here. Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Tobit. Oh, we don't have that. Uh, after that, we have Esther. But like I said, there's different words. Two sides of the same coin. Here's what my Catholic Bible says in this little questions and answers. Though there was broad agreement among early Christians about which books belonged in the Bible, the agreement was not absolute. So important church fathers regarded as unscriptural certain books that we are that are currently in the canon, that's why I've explained that, of the New Testament. Others, equally eminent, thought that certain books not now in the New Testament canon were part of the inspired revelation. Okay? We're not to New Testament yet, so don't get confused. We're not talking about those books. The first church father to list the currently accepted 27 New Testament books was St. Athanius in 367. There's our first compilation. Who settled this issue? Several regional church councils in the later part of the 4th century listed the books of the canon as we kn now know it. Their pronouncements were universally accepted until the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther King's time. We are Protestants, okay? Huh? Did I say King? At least I didn't say Junior. <laughs> um, Eleven centuries later, long time, okay? In response, the canon was reaffirmed by the Catholic, you, you can, you, say it for me, Bob, eucumenical, you, okay, I, yeah, Council of Trent in 1546. So Martin Luther put the Bible, and that's not the only one, this was going on in other countries at the same time, so you can't take God's hand out of the picture, just like in Esther, Okay? The Bible was going into the hands of man instead of being held in the church. And these writings, Martin Luther said, are not inspired. They're fine, but they're not holy scriptures. They're not in the Jewish Bible, and I've got a video to help with this and a sheet to go here because it'll probably do a lot better job than I am. And therefore, he put them at the back. There's the absence from them in our Bible versus being here, okay? But the Catholic Church said no, right back to their answer, and said, yes, there are. 
So that's why the Catholic Bible is different than our Bible, to kind of put it in a sum. Now, you got Eastern Orthodox Church, woo, because we're the Western Church, if you didn't know that. The Eastern Orthodox Church has some more books, 3rd and 4th Maccabees, for example, because they said these should be. <sighs> right? Okay. But here's what point I want to make out of that. We have the Bible that we have. God is orchestrating everything that he has. There's nothing wrong with reading these others. We all agree that those words there in that Bible, the one that's over there, are part of God's holy scripture. If you read those, hey, you'll get the story. You'll see that God put all this together in all these parts of history. It's amazing that we have it. Even during the 400 years of silence from Malachi till Jesus Christ comes, whether there were works written or not, that's when the Jew, Jews took their scrolls and put them together in one. God's hand is all throughout the production of His Word. Okay? So if you want to play the video, Kim, maybe it'll explain what I didn't explain well.
From there, humanity keeps spreading and redefining good and evil, and things go downhill fast. They build cities plagued by violence and oppression, all leading to the foundation of a city called Babylon, where people exalt themselves to the place of God. And now the basic plot conflict of the whole Bible is set. God wants to bless his world and rule it through humans. But now, humans are the problem. They're under the influence of evil, they're stupid and short-sighted, and headed for self-destruction. And this is all a setup for God's solution. We need a new kind of human. And so God promises that a new human will come, who won't give in to the snake. In fact, he'll crush it and be crushed by it. From here, the story traces the promised lineage to a man and woman, Abraham and Sarah. God entrusts them with the same divine blessing given to humanity on page one. And so they leave Babylon to a new garden-like land that God promises to give his family. What follows is the story of Abraham's family. Three generations, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, followed by 12 sons. And our hopes are high until we read their very dysfunctional and destructive family story. They lie, cheat, nearly kill each other, not to mention the sex scandals. But what did you expect after the garden story? They're humans. Eventually, Abraham's family ends up exiled down in Egypt. All these failures of Abraham's family form a dark background for the handful of bright moments in the story. God stays committed to these people. He even makes them an eternal promise called a covenant that he will rescue and bless all humanity through them. How exactly isn't clear. But Abraham's family is at its best when they stop their selfish scheming and trust God's promise with radical faith. From here, the family grows. They end up enslaved in Egypt, and we're introduced to the Torah's other main character, Moses. God raises him up to rescue the Israelites and bring them to a mountain where they're all invited into a covenant relationship with God. They're given 613 terms of the relationship, guidelines for becoming new kinds of humans who will faithfully represent God to the world. And Moses brokers this whole deal because he's awesome. He's the ultimate prophet who speaks God's word to Israel. He's a priest who represents them before God. And he's even called a king, Israel's leader and deliverer in time of need. But as the Torah progresses, the Israelites fail big time. They violate the covenant, and even Moses rebels against God. In fact, the Torah ends with Moses predicting that Israel's failure will continue as they go back into the Promised Land and they're going to end up in exile once again. But he has hope that God will fulfill his promise to rescue Israel. One day he will cover for their failures, he'll heal their selfish hearts so they can truly love God and live. And then Moses dies. Now, the final sentences of the Torah scroll are surprising. They zoom forward in time. And we hear from the prophetic scribes who shape the Tanakh. They reflect back on the story of Moses from their vantage point, And they tell us that never again in Israel's history did a prophet like Moses arise. Man, I wish another prophet, priest, king like him would come along. And with that, we move into the Nevi'im. It has two sub-collections. First, the former prophets. Four narrative works about Israel's story in the Promised Land. Told from the later perspective of the prophets. Things start great with Joshua's leadership. We're told he's successful because he's just like Moses, and he meditates on scripture day and night. But eventually, even Joshua fails, beginning Israel's long and violent descent into self-destruction, just like Moses and the garden story anticipated. These stories mostly focus on the failure of Israel's kings, prophets, and priests, how they lie, cheat, kill each other, and worship idols. It's basically a longer, bloodier replay of the ancestors' failures. But there are some bright spots. God reaffirms his covenant promise to bless humanity through a new human. It will be a king from the line of David. And you get some stories about people like David or Solomon who have moments like Abraham when they trust God, but it never lasts. And wouldn't you know it, the family of Abraham ends up right where they began, conquered and exiled in Babylon. But remember, this whole story is being told from the later perspective of the prophets, and they know exile isn't the end. So they design these stories of Israel's past as pointers to their future hope. When God does rescue his people out of Babylon, he'll send that new king who will be like Moses and David and Solomon were on their good days. In fact, this is what the second part of the Nevi'im, the latter prophets, is all about. There are three large and twelve short works connected to specific prophets. 
And this design intentionally recalls the three plus twelve ancestors from Genesis, whose stories of failure contain the seeds of future hope. These prophetic scrolls are loaded with cross-references that link back into the narrative of the Torah and the prophets, and they carry the story further. The job of Israel's prophets was to be like Moses, to accuse the old Israel of failure and corruption, and to warn them about the looming result, the great day of the Lord, which ended with defeat and exile in Babylon. But the prophets also promised that God had a purpose, to purify his people and recreate a new Israel who would be faithful like Abraham was. They'll live in a new covenant relationship with God under the reign of that promised ruler, who's described as a new Moses, but called by the name David. He will be the one to restore God's blessing to the entire world. The conclusion of the Nevi'im is just like the Torah. There's a note from the Tanakh's prophetic scribes. They reflect back over the whole story so far, and they urge readers to anticipate the arrival of a new Moses-like prophet, who they call Elijah. He will announce the arrival of Israel's God to purify and save his people. From here, we move into the Tanakh's third and final sub-collection, the Ketuvim, a diverse collection of scrolls. Each one has been designed to link back into the key themes from the Torah and the prophets and develop them further through an elaborate tapestry of cross-references. For example, the Psalms scroll is introduced by two poems that are coordinated to the beginning of the Torah and the prophets. In the first psalm, we meet the Righteous One, who is described as a new Joshua, a successful leader who meditates on the scriptures. He's like the king promised by Moses, and he's like the eternal tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Psalm 2 then identifies this figure. It's the promised king, the son of God from the line of David, who's going to defeat evil among the nations and restore God's blessing to the world. And the rest of the psalm scroll teaches God's people how to pray as they wait for this future hope. Then there are the wisdom scrolls that address some of the most difficult questions raised by the story of the Torah and the prophets. So Proverbs sounds like Moses in the Torah. Trust in God, be faithful and obedient, and you'll have peace and success. But then Ecclesiastes and Job reflect back on Israel's complicated history and say, yeah, we tried that, and it's not that simple. These three books carry on a profound conversation about what it means to live wisely in God's good and often confusing world. Two of the last books of the Tanakh to be written make a crucial contribution. The Daniel scroll looks back over the long history of Israel's failure and suffering as a strange door of hope into a new future for the world. One day, that new human promised in the Torah and prophets will arrive. He's going to be trampled by humanity's animal-like inclinations towards evil, but then God will vindicate him and raise him up to rule the world in divine power. And finally, the Scroll of Chronicles retells the entire story of the Tanakh from the beginning up to Israel's return from exile. The author focuses on God's promise to David of a future king who will reunite God's people in a new Jerusalem and bring divine blessing to the nations. The final lines of the Chronicles scroll have been coordinated with key texts from all over the Tanakh. They keep alive the hope of an ultimate return from exile pointing to the arrival of an Israelite whose God is with him, that he may go up and restore the new Jerusalem, and that's how the story ends. The Tanakh is a majestically and intentionally designed collection of ancient Hebrew scrolls. These diverse texts from all periods of Israel's history have been woven together as a unified story about God's covenant promise to Israel and to all humanity. They were made for a lifetime's worth of reading and reflection, as these remarkable human words offer a divine word of wisdom and future hope that still speaks today. Did that help or did that confuse you more? Okay, let me say something that'll put a little clarity maybe to it. Notice all these black spots. That's where man's headed without God. And the Old Testament shows that over and over and over again. So we have a hope, we have a calling for a new man-god to come save us, the New Testament. If you reject this new man-god, which is not on here, that black spot will be what? Will be this time an eternity apart from God. Babylon is a referral to a nation, but it is also a referral to what is opposed to God. 
Even in the millennial reign, we'll see the rest of the prophecies of Jesus come true, but there will still be grace. Time for man to change his mind and accept Jesus Christ. And then the end will come and it's too late. Make sense? So where was Esther in that? You didn't see her in there, did you? Hmm, she's there. <laughs> she's in that last section called the Ketuvim. She, he just didn't mention it. Esther's been a controversy throughout time because God's not mentioned. But we're going to look at that and we're going to see how he is even mentioned. And he was part of that literature. The six extra chapters that are in the uh, Septuagint, the Greek version of the Bible, and in the uh, Catholic Bible add those things in it. They're interspersed into the story to bring God into the story. Okay? Before we look at Esther, though, I wanted to go into Malachi a little bit. I think I've explained or at least butchered as best I can how we got to where we're at, and I think I said what this New Testament was going to be covering and everything. Malachi. That's what you should read today, I believe, or tomorrow. Tomorrow. Last prophet, remember these are prophets, that we have speaking out God's word to the people. And his story's the same. Even out of exile and everything else. Why don't you just obey me? Why don't you worship me? Why do you have other lovers? Why are you against me? But it gets even worse. I'll give you a spoiler alert. Malachi 3, verse 13 through the end of the chapter. This is what God's children say about him. You've said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what's the use of serving God? See where we're at now with the Old Testament? And see from that story how that if you're a Jew and all this came together, that you have a big quandary in front of you, whether you're going to believe in the Messiah or not, because the Old Testament is unfinished. It is broken. It has to have the one promise come who came and laid down his life. But that just doesn't seem rational. Because why would the king of all kings, God, come and lay down his life for me? What an incredible love story. Verse 14 again, You have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? That song shows that Mary, if you think of it that way, was sorry when she sat at Jesus' feet because she didn't want anything other than to worship Him. Verse 15, From now on we will call the arrogant blessed, for those who do evil get rich, and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they, had, what they said. In His presence a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared Him, a pattern from the beginning, and always thought about the honor of His name, not something else. They will be My people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, this day that will come, that came 2,000 years ago and will come again, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Chapter 4. The Lord of heaven's army says the day of judgment is coming. Burning like a furnace on that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will be, go free, leaping with joy like calves, led out to pasture. On the day when I act, you will, you will tread upon the wicked as if they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's army. Remember to obey the laws of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I give, gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the, chil the hearts of the children to their fathers. 
Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, that's the ending of the Old Testament. Did you hear something in there that maybe rings a bell? How about what Luke wrote? Luke wrote those same words in Luke 1, starting in verse 11. While Zechariah, the priest in the temple, who didn't believe the angel that came to him and then had his mouth shut for that very reason, the priest should have, should have you know, believed and they were praying for this. Okay? While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. He will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Because he's announcing the Messiah. Okay? For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Oh, look at this last part. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. 400 years of darkness when no prophet spoke out, and now here Luke is writing about what did happen when John the Baptist came and announced the birth of Jesus Christ. Anyway, I said Esther was a good story. It has the plot and all these elements in it, except where is God? Esther is the heron in the Purim story. Mordecai, or Haman has a plot to eradicate the Jews from history. And this has happened many, many times. It has happened since then too. Don't think this is coincidence. This is God showing His people. Okay? But the plot fails, just like it always fails. Just like it's a miracle that Israel is a nation again today. A miracle from God. It doesn't happen and they establish a celebration if you read in here, in Maccabees, it's called the Day of Mordecai. Oh, well, that's wrong again, isn't it? The current holiday, like I told you, is related to, um, or compared to, Jewish Mardi Gras or Jewish Halloween because they dressed up in costumes and stuff. My, how our holidays get twisted and we lose the meaning. At Christmas... People don't even want you to mention the word Christ, even when Christ is part of Christmas, the death of Christ. Yeah, they want to put Xmas in instead. So this festival has been going on since then, but I wonder how many Jews even realize again and put it together. Okay? King Nebuchadnezzar saw God in a fiery furnace. I'm taking you a little bit through history. Darius got to see God in the lion's den. Cyrus got to see God brought back to his temple in Jerusalem. But what about this King Xerxes, as he's called in the NLT? How did he see God when he's not even mentioned in the book? And if you read, it's just one drunken time of feeling life. It's kind of like as in the days of Noah, and they didn't hear the message, did they? But the message is there. God is there. God cares. God will deliver his people even when they're unfaithful and don't recognize him. What does Purim mean? It simply means lots, if you read it, because Haman worshipped a different god. Even if he didn't say that he did and didn't realize he did, he cast lots to his gods to see what day would be the best day to destroy the nation of Israel. This spiritual battle we face, this cosmic battle. Back to Job, the oldest book written. Back to Revelation, it tells us of the things that must happen before the end comes. Haman was trying to get advice from his gods on how to destroy God's people. <laughs> Look at the irony in that. So there we have the name of Purim. Esther is a scroll. It is read each festive holiday of Purim, and it's held on the same day that the salvation came to the Jews each year. It will be the, four, it's the 14th and 15th of the Hebrew month of Adar, which is late winter or early spring. 
And they read the scroll and then they celebrate salvation. But I wonder, do we really understand where our salvation comes from? If you read through the Old Testament, you know that salvation alone comes from God. But you know the story. You know, Esther, you thought a little bit ago that, that uh, Haman was hung from a rope, didn't you? <laughs> I point that out because you don't know the story as well as you think you do. Every time you open God's Word and you read the Scriptures, it will, God will bring more to light. You should hunger and thirst for that because every time you taste it, you will taste a new sweet morsel that you didn't see before and it will nourish your spiritual body. Esther, is she the main topic of the story? Is she the damsel in distress? Is Mordecai the leader of the Jews? Is Haman the, the evil uh, deceiver, the one that seeks out to destroy us? Or is the story about God? The same story we have in the Old Testament. Now, maybe you see why that's a writing to the Jews, even though God's not mentioned, and they didn't even know it when they put this together. I don't know. But I see the same story over and over. And I see the same pattern that there will be a day of salvation, but this time's a little different because we have a new covenant written in the blood of Jesus Christ. So I want to go through Esther as quickly as possible, and you can go back and read it if you want to. Esther 2, starting in verse 5. At that time there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. He was of the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of, of Kish and Shimei. If you don't notice that, that takes him right back to King Saul. His family had been among those who with King Jehoiakim of Judah had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Now we're getting those sections of history tied together. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassai, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. It's seen as set in history. Verse 10. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so. You've seen from reading that the Jews were hated. Why? Because it's a spiritual battle again. It's not just because they're hated people. It's because they're God's people. So naturally the world is at enmity with them. Babylon, whoever Babylon is, wants to destroy them. Verse 17, And the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. God places ex Esther in exactly the place and time. He knitted her in her mother's womb to be in this position and time in history to save his people. You can call it coincidence if you want to. Verse 21, One day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Big Thana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. He was exactly the right place at the right time again, wasn't he? So she then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. Was this coincidence or is this a God-designed thing? Chapter 3, verse 1. And let's talk about worship here because Jesus said that you serve one master or the other. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, over the other nobles, making him the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down, not just whatever, we're talking worship, before Haman to show him respect. Right there is what the NLT has, but that word is translated the most times in the Bible as worship. The first one is the physical posture, and the second is the adoration for who you are. That's what the words mean. M Mordecai would not bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by, so the for so the king had commanded. But M Mordecai refused to bow down and refused to show him respect. Verse 3. Then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, Why are you disobeying the king's command? Let me reword that. 
Why don't you bow down like other people do? Why are you set apart and different? Hmm. Why do you do these things differently? Perfect opportunity for me to, to tell of the hope that I have. But this story doesn't tell it. They spoke to him day after day, but he still refused to comply with the, with the order. So they spoke to Haman about this to see if he, he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct, since Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. Okay, now we get that in there. This set-apart holy people I can't stand because I don't want to bow down to their God. Even though I've seen it all throughout history, I've seen the God of the Israelites, I still don't want to bow down and worship Him. But yet I bow down and worship the things of this world. Verse 5, and I want you to remember Esther 2.10 said Esther did not foreclose who her nationality was. Again, was that a secret? Was that God telling Mordecai to do this? Verse 5, when Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the empire. Now, that's just stupid. I'll say it like the video did. If you got mad at somebody, if I got mad at John, I wouldn't want to say I want to destroy his whole family name. I want to destroy everybody in, in northern Idaho. And how could that ever even come to be? But it does in this story, right? I'm mad with John. I'm not mad with everybody in Idaho. Okay, but let's read on. Verse 7, and you've got the definition of Purim here. So in the month of April, during the twelfth year of King Xerxes' reign, lots were cast in Haman's presence. The lots were called Purim. This was done to determine the best day and month to take action, and the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. The date set to destroy the Jews, which would later become a celebration that we still celebrate today because it's a celebration of deliverance and salvation for God's people rather than their annihilation. Verse 8, Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, There is a certain race of people. He doesn't even mention Mordecai here again. He's filled with rage for God's people. There's a certain race of people scattered throughout the provinces of, of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. And we know they didn't do this, but at least the remnant did, and it's noticed. Okay, Their laws are different from those of, of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it please the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. Not only does he want to kill the nation, but he's willing to pay. Thursday, I checked what an ounce of silver was worth. It's worth $17.93 per ounce. 10,000 large sacks of silver based on the definition of what the Bible would be would be 460 tons. In today's value, that's 2,663,929,600 dollars that Haman was willing to pay to destroy a nation. You know what it costs to save a nation? Blood of the Son of God. Think about that that he would give his life for me. What does the king say? Basically, he says, keep your money and they destroy the people. Right? Oh. Verse 14. Well, verse 11, 10 and 11. The king agreed, confirming the decision by removing his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, son of Hamadith the Agite, the enemy of the Jews. The enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours. Do as you see fit. Who would ever hear such a story? And wouldn't this bring confusion to the whole land? Okay, verse 14. A copy of this decree was to be issued as law in every province and proclaimed to all people so that they would be ready to do their duty on the appointed day. That literally means be ready, prepared, building up your treasure. Does that not apply to the day that the Lord will return to build up your treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth, to live a set-apart life, to worship God? 
Verse 15, At the king's command the decree went out by swift messengers, and it was also proclaimed in the fortress of Susa. Then the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa, Susa fell into confusion. The people were confused because literally they thought, Are we next? The word's only used two other times. It's used in Exodus 14.3. That's when the people of Israel were pinned between the mountains and the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was coming after them. They thought God would deliver them, but now all hope was lost because they're pinned between a mountain and the sea. You know what happens. <laughs> God parts the Red Sea and the people of Israel go through and all Pharaoh's army is destroyed. That's why we're to walk by faith, not by sight. The other time it's used in Scripture is Joel 1.18 when the locusts have ravaged the whole land and there's nothing left to eat whatsoever. So not only are the people of God wondering what they're going to eat, it says that the cattle was perplexed, wondering what they were going to eat. Now what does it take to get a cow to think about what it's going to eat or it's going to die? That's the other two times that that's used in Scripture. Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on burlap and ashes, and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. I see God now. Even though he's not mentioned, I see him crying out to his God. He went as far as the gates of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And as the news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They also fasted, wept, and wailed. And many people put lay in burlap and ashes. Skipping down to verse 10. Then Esther told Hatcha to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden scepter. And the king has not called for me to come for him for 30 days. So it looks even hopeless that Esther put in the spot that she's put in is not going to be any help whatsoever because the king has not even asked her for help. And Esther has to decide, am I willing to die? Verse 13, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther, Don't you think for a moment that because you're in the palace that you will escape when the other Jews are killed? There is a cost involved for following Jesus. Diedrich Bonhoeffer and... Who wrote Chronicles of Narnia? C.S. Lewis both said basically when Jesus gives you the call... He gives you the call to die. That you will forsake everything else. That you'll fall at his feet in worship for who he is and especially for what he's done for you. Verse 14, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place because God has made a promise to walk with his people, to make Abraham's descendants as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashore, the number of stars in the heavens. But you and your relatives will still die anyway. Who knows if perhaps you were not made queen for such a time as this. What an amazing story. Even though God is not mentioned in there at all, what an amazing story that the people have kept on as tradition to remind them, hopefully they are reminded, of what God does and how faithful He is. So I want to close by reading, which is found in here and found in the Greek Septuagint, Mordecai's prayer and Esther's prayer. Okay, I'm not being blasphemous or anything. I'm reading an additional reading like I'd read something from Max Licato. Okay, Mordecai's prayer. Then Mordecai prayed to the Lord, calling to remembrance all the works of the Lord. He said, O oh Lord, Lord, you rule as king over all kings. For the universe is in your power, and there is no one who can oppose you when it is your will to save Israel. For you have made heaven and earth and every wonderful thing under heaven. You are Lord of all, and there is no one who can resist you, Lord. You know all things. You know, O oh Lord, that it was not in insolence or pride or for any love of glory that I did this and refused to bow down to this proud Haman. 
for I would have been willing to kiss the soles of his feet to save Israel. But I did this so that I might not set human glory above the glory of God. And I will not bow down to anyone but you. You are my Lord, and I will not do these things in pride. And now, O Lord, God and King, God of Abraham, spare your people, for the eyes of your foes are upon us to annihilate us. And they desire to destroy the inheritance that has been yours from the beginning. Do not neglect your portion which you redeemed for yourself out of the land of Egypt. Hear my prayer and have mercy upon your inheritance. Turn your mourning into feasting that we may live and sing praise to your name. O Lord, do not destroy the lips of those who praise you. And all of Israel cried out mightily for their death was before their eyes. Esther's prayer. Then Queen Esther, seized with deadly anxiety, fled to the Lord. She took off her splendid apparel and put on the garments of distress and mourning. And instead of costly perfume, she covered her head with ashes and dung. She utterly humbled herself, or humbled her body. Every part that she loved to adorn, she covered with her tangled hair. She prayed to the Lord God of Israel and said, O oh my Lord, you only are our king. Help me. Who am I alone and have no helper but you? For my danger is in my hand. Ever since I was born, I have heard of the tribe of my family that you, O Lord, took Israel out of all the nations and that our ancestors from among all, the, all their forebears for an everlasting inheritance, that you did, did for them all that was promised. And now we have sinned before you and you have handed us over to our enemies because we glorified their gods you are righteous, O Lord, and now they are not satisfied they, that we are, bit, are in bitter slavery. But they have con covenanted with their idols to abolish what your mouth has ordained and to destroy your inheritance, to stop the mouths of those who praise you and to quench your altar and glory of your house, to open the mouths of nations for the praise of vain idols and to magnify forever a mortal king. O Lord, do not surrender your scepter to what has no being. And do not let them laugh at our downfall, but turn their plan against them and make an example of him who began this against us. Remember, O Lord, make yourself known in this time of our affliction and give me courage. O King of, of the gods and masters of all domain, put eloquent speech in my mouth before the lion and turn his heart to hate the man who is fighting against us so that there may be an end of him and those who agree with him. But save us by your hand and help me who, who, am, who am alone and have no helper but you, O Lord. You have knowledge of all things, and you know that I hate the splendor of the wicked and abhor the bed of the uncircumcised and of any alien. You know my necessity, that I abhor the sign of my proud position, which is upon my head on days when I appear in public. I abhor it like a filthy rag, and I do not wear it on the days when I am at leisure. And your servant has not eaten at Haman's table, and I have not honored the king's feast or drunk the wine of libations. Your servant has had no joy since the day that I was brought here until now, except in you, O Lord God of Abraham. O God, whose might is over all, hear the voice of the despairing, and save us from the hands of evildoers, and save me from my fear." Now, those are eloquent prayers. They're not in our Bible. They don't contradict anything. They talk about the time when Mordecai did fast and pray and wail, and, and so did Esther. Maybe that's their prayers. Maybe it's not. But what I want us to remember out of this is that God is in control. He is the God of all of our days. He always will be. And there will be a day when Jesus Christ returns. Are we going to worship Him or not? I'll close us in Scripture, and then there's an ending song that Kim will just play. But you'll have to put the Scripture up there for me, Kim. I don't have it here. Hopefully I can read it from here. <laughs> Blessed is the man who makes, who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look at the proud to those who... Yeah, thank you. Turn aside to false gods. Many, O oh Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you have planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I, were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, 
but my ears you have pierced. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you do not require. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. Amen. Amen. Hope that helped.